Are you saying that a, in a culturally pluralistic society, such as America, are you saying that the variable in success or lack of success is the culture of the particular group? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. And I'm saying it not only for the United States, but in terms of the studies of various other countries around the world, the same thing seems to be true. You not only find uh, the same group having the same characteristics in country after the country, that is, the Germans produced uh, the first pianos in Australia, they created the piano industry in the United States, they built the first pianos in England, they built the first pianos in Russia. Uh, you look at the Chinese, what they major in in Malaysia in college is what they major in in the United States in college. Namely science and technology. Science and technology, heavily. Uh, and this follows the group around the world. So the notion that the group is a creature of society, that society has shaped the, the group, uh, just will not stand up to the facts. If you say that culture is the variable in success, mm. which means conversely, culture is the variable in failure, and you cite uh, the phenomenal achievement of West Indians, mm. which is the largest black immigrant group in the United States, yes. Uh, their phenomenal success in the United States, I think they earn about, 50, second generation earns about 15% more than, average than, than, than the average American. Than yes. the average American. But they don't do well in their own native countries, and they don't do well in England. Now, if, if culture is the variable, why is that a fact? I guess you'd have a selective migration uh, uh, coming into this. That's also true of other groups, by the way. The Chinese are prosperous everywhere in the world except China. Uh, the Indians are prosperous throughout Africa, but they are in terrible shape in India. They are prosperous in Malaysia, they are prosperous in the other parts of the world, Burma at one time. Uh, there are many groups which, when, when freed from the constraints of their particular society, uh, burst forth with all the other abilities that they have. In their own homes, uh, they're, 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 they're throttled by various other factors. Now, you as was explained to me, it is the notion of, it, it let's say you're on the admissions committee at Harvard. Mm. and you're going to choose so many people. You're going to let people in for a variety of reasons. One is sheer academic merit. Uh, they scored 1,600 on the college boards. Mm. That's a good entry. They've got a brilliant uh, academic and athletic background, mm. and they happen to be a virtuoso violin player. Mm -hmm. you know? oh, yeah. And the violin player helps. Yeah. Or let's say they come from Nevada. Mm, and they don't right. have a lot of Nevada yeah. at Harvard. And let's also say that they uh, are come from uh, Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. They don't have many people from Sri Lanka yes. there. And let's also say that, that they also are African-American. Mm -hmm. And that that ought to be a factor in, in choosing from that pool. Maybe that's one of the because, considerations. Because what? Uh, because diversity of a student now, body I, I is a healthy factor. I'm, I'm fascinated with the extent to which words, we, we're, we're conditioned to react like Pavlov's dog to words. I hear diversity. Someone was asking me... That'll make me look bad, Professor. <laughs> Someone today who's a, who's, a, who's a trustee of a college was saying that the, they were going to pick a new college professor. I said, what you should do is have a stopwatch there and just count how long it is to, to, to each of the uh, contestants says the word diversity. Yeah. And the guy who says it, you know, he's 35 minutes into the interview, and the other guy who says it, you know, the first sentence, the guy who said it takes 35 minutes, he should be at the top of the list. The guy who said it the first sentence should be at the bottom. Because the well, question well, is... Well, what's wrong with diversity? I don't get the point. My point is that this is a word that has become magic. What does it mean, if anything? Are you saying to me that all black people are alike, therefore you've got to mix and match by race? It's not diverse unless it's diverse along these no, dimensions? No, I'll tell you what I'm saying. I'm saying that I think that it would be different to have people of different kinds of experiences. Uh, and we mentioned Sri Lanka, didn't we? And, you know, and it'd be interesting to have some people uh, with an Asian oh, wait, background. No, no, wait, 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 an Asian background, African-American. Uh, people uh, that come from uh, Fifth Avenue and Park Avenue, as well as from Henderson, North Carolina. All of that would make a healthy student body. You mean to tell I don't me. think everybody ought to come from uh, the sons of, of uh, Harvard graduates. Places like Harvard and Stanford and right. Cornell, what you, what you have is the black son of the black doctor right. who right. lived in the same right. neighborhood right. with the white son of the white doctor. Right. No, I, I, and yeah, now yeah. you're giving me diversity because these two people well, probably would not, not go no, someplace. No, 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 not necessarily. They have scholarships that they offer to kids who but, are not but, the but, son that, of but, but now we're getting away from the whole racial thing. I'm saying the racial thing has been used as a proxy for something that it's not a proxy for because the vast majority of blacks who go to places like Harvard and, Col and Cornell and Stanford are not blacks from the ghetto. Those are blacks from out there. You know, they're from Malibu. Uh, you know, they're from Pacific Palisades, uh, they're but, from Winnetka, and okay, so forth, and they're, they're from the very same neighborhoods. 
They're from the very same neighborhoods as the whites are there. And so, and so now you call it diversity right. because you see something with the, with the, with the, with the naked eye. Can I ask a question about unemployment? Uh, the latest figures I saw indicated that of black youth, something like 46% of those who wanted jobs were unable to get jobs. I really would like this time to ask both of you to respond to what would you do in that situation? If you would assume for a moment that these are people who do want jobs and are unable to find work. I would, first of all, uh, repeal the minimum wage law because if you go back to, say, 1950, 1948, 49, 50, you find that at that time the unemployment rate among black teenagers was a fraction of what it is today. And there certainly wasn't any less racism then than there is today. Uh, what was different was that at that time, the minimum wage law was a decade old. It was a decade of inflation, and the law hadn't been changed. So for all practical purposes, it didn't exist. Well, don't you think and that was you also a decade of expansion, in which there were a lot of jobs, whereas today our economy is in a recession, and look, there are not that many jobs If you available. look at the most prosperous years of the 60s and 70s, you don't find black teenage unemployment as low as it was in the recession year of 1949. Well, I don't know what the job situation was then, but it's only recently that we have I do. I was a black teenager in 1949. Did you it was get a recession job? year, and after a considerable looking, I found a job. But the point is, the kid who was living where I lived then, who's living there now, he has a hell of a lot harder time finding that job because there are so many good people who have tried to do good for him and priced mm -hmm. him right out of the market. Well, facing the situation... Healthcare. Let me give you a quotation and a fact. The quotation comes from you in Basic Economics. Quote, a long-standing staple of political rhetoric has been the attempt to keep the prices of medical care reasonable or affordable, yet the amount of resources required to supply the things we want are wholly independent of what we are willing to pay. It is completely unreasonable to expect reasonable prices. That's the quotation. Here's the fact. The United States de devotes 17% of its GDP to health care. The next country down in that is Switzerland mm -hmm. at about 11% mm -hmm. of its GDP. So we devote something like 50% more mm -hmm. than the next country down. Now, surely it's not unreasonable <laughs> to suggest that we're just spending too much. The question is, uh, when people are spending their own money, I, I don't know how third parties can say it's too much. Well, ironically, Rahm Emanuel's uh, brother, who's a doctor, uh, has on board for this whole Obamacare thing. But really, he, he, he revealed why Americans spend more. Uh, Americans uh, don't, when they go to a hospital, they are in private or semi-private rooms more often than in countries on government uh, uh, health care. And so instead of being in a ward, uh, you're in your own private or semi-private room. It costs more. Uh, you know, American doctors are more readily available. Uh, there is less waiting time. Uh, some people prefer to pay in money and others in waiting time. Now, when you have a painful disease and the government tells you it's a, there's a six-month waiting list, uh, that you, you're paying in a different way. It doesn't show up in the statistics. But you may, you may not even live the six months, depending on what you have. So we pay seven. We pay more and get more. That's it. That's 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 it. That's all there is to it. That's you, it. You don't want to say, but uh, at the same time, our system is terribly inefficient in various ways. You no, don't... It's, not, it's not inefficient for people to buy what they want. It, what's it has to be more complicated than that. <laughs> You know, it's what's inefficient is having third parties decide what you need and don't need. As for example, in Sweden, where if they and it's not like an insurance company right. saying they won't pay for it. In Sweden, if they say that you don't need this, you can't pay for it with your own money, because they control the whole system. And so your your choice at that point is to leave Sweden, uh, which if you're very sick may be a little hard to do, or right. to have what you need smuggled into you. Right, Tom. But this sort of reminded me of what's happening with these Wall Street protests. And this is what you said from the Thomas Sowell Reader. This is the age of complaining classes, whether they are lawyers, community activists, radical feminists, race hustlers, or other squeaking wheels looking for oil. No society ever thrived because it had a large and growing class of parasites living off of those who produce. Is what we're hearing with these Wall Street protest protests just from this complaining class? Oh, I, absolutely. Uh, I can't imagine when I was uh, their age 
that I would have enough money that I could afford to hang around in parks for weeks on end, <laughs> uh, not making, not not doing any work and uh, not bringing in any income. Well, and the incredible thing is, there, there. Would it be your feeling that if all the affirmative action programs were discontinued, women and minorities would go ahead much faster than they have under the affirmative action program? Yes. The, it's, not my, not, it's not my opinion. Uh, the data indicate that, for example, Puerto Ricans had a higher percentage of the national average income before quotas than after. So did Mexican Americans. Blacks had about the same. So there's, again, there's a marvelous putting of the burden on other people. You're saying here's this, mag this massive program that has existed now for a decade, That's and, you're, not, and you're unable to show me the, things that the benefits better. that have come from all this enormous controversy. Well, I certainly has been a revolution insofar as women's participation in the labor force. Not really. And not really. Concerned. No, it hasn't. No, well, I it know hasn't. that of my own knowledge. No, it? you don't know it of your own knowledge because I've also looked at the same thing. And in the past you found women overrepresented in many professional occupations much more so than today and you find that decline in those occupations much more highly correlated with a lower age of marriage for college women and with more childbearing and as those two things those two demographic factors have changed women have also changed in their representation so uh, there's this whole myth that's been created that this is all a function of political developments of the past uh, decade or so just will not stand up thank you very much New York Times writer Nicholas Kristof, I'm quoting you, asserts that there is, overwhel I'm qu you're quoting him, overwhelming evidence that centuries of racial subjugation still shape inequity in the 21st century, quote, closing quote, and he mentions, open quote, the lingering effects of slavery, close quote. And now this is Tom Sowell. If we wanted to be serious about evidence, we might compare where blacks stood a hundred years after the end of slavery with where they stood after 30 years of the liberal welfare state. Yes. Explain that. Well, in 1960, which would be almost 100 years after the end of slavery, 22% right. of black kids grew up in homes with only one parent. Just 22%? Yes. Four out of five were in homes with both parents. Yes. Uh, 30 years later, after the liberal welfare state, that number had more than tripled. And so I say, well, let us compare. If, if we, we can speculate on how much that 22% was due to the legacy of slavery. But we know that that tripling was not due to the legacy of slavery. It was due to the legacy of a whole different set of policies. And you can, and, and you can look at it so many other ways. Uh, education. Uh, Stuyvesant High School in New York, as you know, you get into only by passing a very tough exam. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2012, the percentage of black students who had gotten into Stuyvesant High School was less than one-tenth of the percentage of black students who had gotten into Stuyvesant High School 33 years earlier. I didn't know that. Dunbar High School in Washington, which was an elite black high school for a very long time. In 1993, the number of uh, kids out of Dunbar High School who went on to college was less than it was 60 years earlier, which would have been in the depth of the Great Depression. Uh, and so you can run through a whole bunch of other things like that. Uh, look at the housing projects. Uh, the housing projects in the first half of the 20th century, during that first 100 years after slavery, uh, were, ha did not have the high crime rates, the murder rates, uh, the graffiti, uh, the, all the rest of it, we, we so none of that was there. Uh, people, uh, in fact, the New York Times, I should, uh, uh, Christoph should read his own pa old papers, uh, uh, pointed out that on Saturday mornings, it was common in the housing project of this earlier era mm -hmm. for, for parents to leave their doors unlocked because some of the parents could afford television, some couldn't. So the ones who had television would leave their doors unlocked, and the kids from the other families could come down there and watch television with them. Well, now the latest figures show that uh, most people below the poverty line have two television sets and cable, but they wouldn't dare leave their doors unlocked in a public housing project. In intellectuals in society, whom do you mean? I mean people whose end products are ideas. Uh, there are other people, people with great uh, intelligence 
whose end products are things like the soft vaccine. Uh, there are a research scientist is not necessarily an intellectual. That's right. He, he, an engineer isn't necessarily right. an intellectual. That's right. Because the, the engineer is, is judged by uh, the end product, of wh which is not simply ideas. If he builds a building that collapses, it doesn't matter how brilliant his, his idea was, uh, he's ruined. Uh, conversely, if an intellectual who's brilliant has an, has an idea to, for rearranging society, and that ends in disaster, he pays no price at all. I see. Let me quote a intellectuals in society, quote, the fatal misstep of intellectuals is assuming that superior ability within a particular realm can be generalized to superior wisdom or morality overall. Chess grandmasters, musical prodigies, and others who are as remarkable within their respective specialties as intellectuals within theirs seldom make that mistake. Explain that. Why would it? Well, let's take an example. Noam Chomsky, mm -hmm. whom you write about in Intellectuals yeah. in Society, whose work in linguistics, in the first place, I can't understand it, but as best I can tell, everyone who understands exactly everyone who understands his technical work within the field within his discipline of linguistics mm -hmm. considers him one of the great figures of the 20th century, mm -hmm. and his work in politics, uh, uh, absurdity. The same could be said of uh, Bertrand Russell and his and his uh, uh, landmark works on on mathematics and other people in other fields, uh, but they step outside their field. And uh, when you step outside your level of uh, specialty, sometimes that's like st stepping off a cliff. And why is it that intellectuals, that is to say people whose end product is ideas, should succumb to that temptation more than, to use your example, a chess grandmaster? Because a, a chess grandmaster can be world famous for doing absolutely nothing more than winning chess tournaments and making displays, as many of them do, of playing uh, five chess games uh, simultaneously while blindfolded. Uh, so Bobby Fischer had no need to opine on the politics of the day because he was getting he, rich he, and famous and making a brilliant career for himself within his narrow profession. That's right, that's right. But intellectuals, what, they, they, well, it, they, it, la it, they languish it, we, in obscurity? But, no matter well, how smart. well, the whole question of uh, when is someone well known or not, uh, came up during the visit of Jim, uh, Jim Flynn from uh, uh, New Zealand here a few years ago. He's one of the world's authorities on IQ tests. Mm -hmm. uh, people, you know, in India know about Jim Flynn. People in England, he's going, he made a world tour. Uh, but I doubt if the people in the next block from where he lives knows who he, know, know who he is. I see. All right. Um.